Okay, I, I think we'll go ahead and get going. I um, think a few more kind of dribbling in here still, but let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, and thanks for everyone who, who is here on time. Well, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Jasper Fruit. After receiving a PhD in science from the University of Amsterdam in 2004, Jasper spent five years as a postdoctoral fellow at Los Alamos National Lab, and then he joined UCI in uh, 2010 as assistant professor with a joint appointment in civil and environmental engineering and here in ESS. His research combines numerical modeling with inverse modeling to understand and improve Earth system predictability. And today, uh, Jasper is going to be giving us an update on his recent work on model evaluation and diagnostics. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Jasper. Thank you, uh, Alex, for your uh, introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a little strange always presenting this way, but uh, it's also nice to be able to walk away during a lecture for a few minutes, get something to eat downstairs and come back up. So anyway, uh, I... Um, while I was making my slides, I decided to uh, change the design and uh, that created some difficulties. So as you see, I have some white space on the left and the right. I thought that's a nicer projection, but while doing that, um, some of the content of the slides changed. So hopefully that's not gonna pose any problems. So I was gonna talk today a little bit about um, the work that I, my students and I and collaborators do um, a lot of that involves data, computer models, and computer algorithms, and um, with emphasis on computer algorithms, methods, methods, design, development, etc. Um, I will not go in detail about different methods. Um, I've done that in the past, but I want to keep as many of you um, in this seminar. So um, if you're interested in the details of some of these methods, then you can read the papers or you can ask. So um, I will uh, first just give a general overview and then I will quickly go over some applications and discuss a little bit of the latest work we did. So first, I, uh, the first uh, slide, as you see, does not really have a title. Um, when I'm asked to give seminars, um, I always struggle a little bit like, what shall I present? So I ask about the audience and then they give, sometimes they don't really know what the audience is. So then I have to guess a little bit, but um, if it's about a specific topic, specific application, then it's much easier. But if it's about for a uh, general audience, then I tend to want to cover more ground in terms of diversity. So hopefully um, you like the talk and otherwise uh, you can always leave. Um, good, thank you, okay. So let me start. Um, dynamic complex systems. Here's an example. Um, this is an uh, eco-hydrologic problem, say, a uh, soil hydrologic problem. Um, we like to characterize the moisture distribution around this tree. So how would we do that? Um, so we start with a hypothesis, a hypothesis formulation. We have all done this or do this and in our fields that usually entails a computer model, which summarizes everything we know about this system in you know, equations. After we have our hypothesis, so in this case, our hypothesis um, could be an, uh, a numerical model of the system. So after we have our model, we come up with an experimental design. So in the experimental design, if we wanna evaluate our model, we need to decide what are we going to measure? Where are we going to measure? What sensors are we going to use, et cetera? Then we proceed with data collection. Um, that is usually very difficult. Um, I've collected a lot of data when I was a student and uh, that was in summers in the Netherlands. I was asked to look at the latent heat flux of the forest um, within the canopy and above the canopy. And um, the previous summer was a really warm summer. So I had expected to get wonderful three, four weeks periods of really nice continuous data sets. And unfortunately, the summer I was measuring, we had rain about every week, which makes it difficult because um, if you want to look at latent heat fluxes and the canopy gets wet, you're measuring interception evaporation. So you first need to make sure that your canopy is dry 
and the forest floor is dry. So that took an additional interception model, um, et cetera. So it made things difficult. So data collection can be very difficult, but if you collect the data yourself, you really appreciate it because you know exactly what it means, what you have, uh, have some idea about the uncertainty, the spatial uh, variability, et cetera. After we have our data, we proceed with hypothesis testing. That means we look at our model, we look at our data, and hopefully we try to learn something from this. Because the ultimate goal is hypothesis reformulation, and that's most difficult. So in this example, let's consider our model to be a you know, model of the tree and the, the roots. Then our data collection could be the soil water potential, the sap flux in the tree, and soil moisture measurements. Then our hypothesis testing is, for instance, looking at the output, what the model predicts in terms of the sap flux uh, measured. You see the dots are measured and you see the continuous blue line that is the simulated sap flux in this case. So the next question now is, okay, we see a systematic mismatch, particularly at the daytime. You see that the measured sap flux, um, you know, there's the scattering the data, but seems to go a little higher than the simulation. Same at nighttime, we see some clutter. So now the question is, what is wrong in the model? And that unfortunately is a very complicated. Um, so this is something I've worked on for about 20 years now. And uh, I think we made some progress. Um, when I started as a student, I was always seeking, um, yeah, universal solutions, but having worked on so many different problems in the, uh, over the past years, um, you come to a realization that um, you cannot come up with a universal framework. You can come up with ingredients that you need, but you cannot come up with one methodology that will help you find structural errors in models and that applies to whatever problem you're working on. So it's a very complicated thing. So let's say that through our analysis of model structure errors, we would come up that we have to change the root distribution because obviously we need to make assumptions how the roots look in the soil or the distribution. We can parameterize that, but even then your model, your assumptions of that, of those roots may be wrong. So is it possible, that's the question, is it possible to use data and learn what is actually wrong in our model? Now, let me go back to the start. Um, for those that wonder what I'm doing or what I have done in the past is when I was a student, a professor came to me and says, Jasper, I need to characterize the hydraulic functions of the soil. So you see here an, uh, a soil profile and we want to characterize the hydraulic properties of that soil because we like to describe contaminant transport, water transport from the soil surface to the groundwater. So work has been done on that. So you take a sample from the field and you start reading the literature and in the literature you read that various groups in the world have developed what's called a multi-step outflow experiment. So how does that work? You take a sample and you let it drain a little bit. You make sure that it's just saturated enough and then you apply pneumatic pressure. And what happens is that you'll have outflow. And after each pneumatic pressure, you, you have an increment. So each time you increase the pneumatic pressure and each time you get outflow. Now, apparently, if we look at this now, then the underlying idea is that if you plot the cumulative outflow as function of time, then that should contain the information about the hydraulic properties. So here you see, after each pressure increment, you see how the soil responds. And I think you would more or less agree that this curve would be different for, for a sand, a clay, and a silt soil. Um, clay will probably retain much more water because its surface area is much larger because its particles are, are uh, much smaller. So London van der Waals forces are much larger for the clay. So it will retain the water much better. So now we have the measured outflow curve. We need to go to the hydraulic functions. So how do we do that? Now, that is the difficult part, and that is where we need a model. And that model is, in this case, is an equation is Richard's equation. 
Um, Lorenzo Richards, uh, 1931, came up with this equation. Um, it's not that difficult uh, to derive, it's actually really easy. You have the continuity equation, uh, which is uh, mass conservation, and then you add to that equation Darcy's law, Buckingham Darcy, and that gives you Richards' equation. Now, this is the mixed formulation. You see H, which is the so what a pressure hat or the matrix hat on uh, the right side, and you see theta, which is the moisture content on the left-hand side. Now, if we wanna solve this equation, we need to describe or prescribe the soil water retention function and the hydraulic conductivity function. So those are two equations. This is the formulation of uh, Van Genuchten, a uh, famous paper in 1980, uh, probably the most cited paper in hydrology, I think. Um, so, and what I did is, the parameters in these functions, I highlighted them, I coded them in um, dark red. So we essentially boiled down this multi-step outflow experiment to estimation of those red, dark uh, colored symbols, which in this case are six, theta S, theta R, alpha N, K, S, and lambda. Okay, now, so now what do we, uh, what do, we do? We just use the measure data to back out the unknown parameters. Now, fortunately, we can you know, measure the saturated volumetric moisture content, theta S, and the saturated hydraulic conductivity with another experiment, and that leaves us with four parameters. So what do we do now? We just try some values. This is parameter estimation. Many of uh, you, know, you have probably done this. So we simulate an experiment, this outflow experiment, and see how well it corresponds to the data. So what you see here, this correspondence is not particularly good. So what we do is we change the parameter values. And if we change, then we should get another simulation. And that's what you see, get another simulation. It's get, it gets a little closer to the data. We do another try and it's getting better and better. And finally, after four attempts, which is incredibly, incredibly efficient, of course, um, in this case, um, because this data is created with a numerical model, so this is not real data, you see that we arrive at a simulation that almost perfectly goes through the data. Now, that's wonderful, because now, as a next step, we can plot the hydraulic functions. And that's how the water retention function would look like, and this is how your hydraulic conductivity function would look like. And that's what we wanted. So this whole process, what we just did is we did an experiment, we collected data, we set up a numerical model, and we essentially calibrated that model, and that gave us the hydraulic functions. That's what we did. Now, this is a very well-contained problem because we know the boundary conditions. We know exactly when we increase the pressure for how long, we know the water level in the burette. We know the boundary conditions perfectly. We also, the soil is contained, so it's a perfect situation. Also, it's relatively simple in that we have one covering process, that's water flow, Richards equation. And so it's relatively simple. Unfortunately, this is not the case in many, many uh, um, practical applications because we're dealing with systems that are very complex that are spatially distributed, where we have boundary conditions that are difficult to measure. And if we can measure them, we can only measure them at certain locations. We have relatively poor process understanding. So all these issues and others make modeling very difficult, accurate modeling. So let's take one step back. If we have a model, then that model will have parameters as inputs, and those parameters are uncertain. Models also have forcing data, boundary conditions, or control inputs, depending on the field you work in. Model has physical constants. For instance, gravitational acceleration is a constant, essentially, um, that you can enter, of which you know that its knowledge is almost perfect. Okay, so you have constants in your model whose values you essentially know almost, um, yeah, without any uncertainty. So 
perfectly. Then we also have material properties. Um, so if we look at uh, our uh, uh, soil hydrologic example, uh, the spatial variability of the soil. Um, so that by itself has a lot of uncertainty. We also have the initial state that goes into our model. For instance, when we start the experiment in our model, we need to know exactly the water distribution in the sample or the soil water pressure head with depth that's equivalent. Now, because all these entities, the parameters, the forcing data, the material properties, the initial state are uncertain, if you propagate that through your model, you'll have a certain output. Now we have uncertain observations. So what I work on, have worked on, is how do we merge the output of a model that's uncertain with uncertain observations so that we learn something and that something may be about the model, that something may be about process uh, uh, knowledge, that something may be that, you know, we want to issue better forecasts. Um, that's usually in engineering um, the easiest selling item if you can show that you can improve uh, short-term or long-term forecasts. But it is complicated, particularly in the last, you know, 15, 20 years with so much data becoming available. How do we use all that data and combine that with numerical models so that we can answer important questions that go uh, beyond just very domain specific questions. It's a complicated. Now they even your refrigerator measures data, right? So how can we put all that data together from different domains and numerical models? How can we link them to answer important questions? So number five here highlighted in red is the model structural issue so that's something i've been focused on for about 10 12 years uh, going back to when i was a student uh that's what my professor posed as problem um so um and if we know the structural error the epistemic error in the model so what's wrong in the model equations that's key to model improvement which means better theory um, and that's again very, very difficult, but that's ideally that's part of the iterative research cycle. We use data to improve our models. The, the common approach is, particularly in uh, earth systems, is to make models more complicated. That is, if a model does not describe the data, we start hypothesizing what potential process may not be included in the model and a group will develop that module and that model is then added to the model. So that leaves you with extremely complicated models. Really, really millions of lines of code, very hard to have an overview. And you can ask whether that's really necessary or whether you can go back to 300 lines of code that can explain maybe not what the model with 3 million lines of code can, but can catch you to 85, 90%. Um, so key to model improvement, structural errors. Okay, so what I've worked on is, if you wanna do this data, model data synthesis, you first need to work on optimization methods, which means is I have data, I have a model, and I just wanna estimate the parameters. And my focus was on trying to find new methods that can do that efficiently. In this case, we only have two parameters. So this is just for illustration. And you see the problem here that if I would start here, why on the vertical axis is a mismatch between the model and data. So that's called the objective function. If I would start here and I would use a gradient based method, which is supposed to be efficient, it will catch you to the right solution because this is the absolute minimum. It's a global minimum. If you use the same gradient-based method, but you would start here, you're essentially ending up in the wrong solution. So even a very simple problem can pose difficulties for an optimization algorithm. So how can we develop what would, how would the method need to be to be able to handle these difficulties and then 
involving hundreds of parameters. So that's something I worked on and published on. Um, and the ultimate outcome of that is, is that there was a, for many, many years in the optimization literature, people were always trying to find a single algorithm that would work very well for a large range of problems. And I think the contribution that we um, um, had was that to show that you should not be expecting that there's one algorithm that works well for a large range of problems. Instead, you should use a combination of methods. So an algorithm, a wrapper that can, that's adaptive, that based on the problem at hand can select the best method. So that's where we came up with the concept of how you can do that. It's called amalgam, a multi-method optimization. So that's something I don't, don't do much research on this anymore, but now extension of single objective optimization is to multi-criteria optimization. So now you have a problem with two objectives or more. And if you have two or more objectives, you no longer have one optimal solution. Instead, you're going to have what's called a Pareto front. And you see here the gray line, that's the Pareto front. And essentially, you want to find solutions that are on that line. Now, that's uh, optimization. So now you're dealing with more than one objective. And um, you're, you're, hopefully your algorithm can find all these Pareto solutions. So here is uh, people sometimes wonder, like, how can that be? I have two objectives and there's what's called trade-off. Now, here's an example. Try to make an, uh, a little uh, um, animated movie, but here is a land allocation problem. So imagine that you're asked to develop a residential or an area, and this area is 10 by 10 cells, really easy. And you talk to your uh, city um, and they told you, okay, you need to develop this in an X number of residential cells, an X number of commercial cells, and the rest is recreation. So in other words, the number of blue, green, and yellow cells, that is fixed. And now you come up with a development plan and your only goal is to minimize cost. So that's what you see here on the x-axis, the development cost. You come up with a map that minimizes cost and that's this map that you saw initially. You see here, we walk along this Pareto front. So this map, this is one, this one minimizes cost essentially. Um, so, or so, so, yeah, so essentially um, that may not be desirable, a map that minimizes cost, because you may, up, may end up with a map where you have a patch of green in between all the homes, whereas the government or the city officials tell you, no, we want a recreational area to be connected. So you want spatial compactness. You don't want a commercial building in a neighborhood, in the center of a neighborhood. Even though that may minimize cost, it's not spatially compact. It's not a realistic solution. So now you have two objectives. You want to minimize cost and you want to maximize spatial compactness. And that gives you a Pareto front. And that's how you see the different solutions here. Okay. So other things we worked on is data simulation. I, in a little bit, I'll show an example uh, um, in ecological forecasting. So what is data assimilation? Imagine you have some numerical model and that issues a forecast, prediction or simulation. So that's our state variable, X. Now, at time is one, you see here the predicted state. So in this case, we have one state variable and it has essentially it's one value. In reality, we have thousands of state variables, but imagine we make it simple, we just have one state variable. Now we have a measurement. And we like to incorporate that measurement and use that to update our state variable. For instance, in weather forecasting, if I would issue a prediction for tomorrow, and tomorrow I know what, that, what the actual prediction was because I can take a measurement. So now I can compare my prediction with the measurement. Then it would be foolish to keep forecasting with the model I ran yesterday for today, today for tomorrow. No, I want to incorporate that data point in my model to update the state and then forecast to tomorrow. Because if you're systematically off, why, why would you continue forecasting? So this is called data summation. How does it work? This is then what's called the analysis state. And instead of simulating forward from your original forecasted state, that is the um, 
gray square, you actually use the analysis state. And then you forecast from there to the next day or the next time. And there again, you get an incoming observation and you do the same thing. So this process is called data assimilation. Now, for many years, this was only possible for relatively simple models until Evenston developed a methodology that allows application of this approach to dynamic system models that are complex and not difficult or not easy uh, or that you don't need to linearize around the current state. So what you do is you run ensembles essentially. So based on multiple ensembles, you can create covariances, forecast errors, etc. So this ensemble common filter is a very useful method and I'll show an application later. So what I worked on is an extension of this to what's called a particle filter. So an ensemble common filter makes an assumption that at the time of the update, that the measurement is Gaussian, the error is Gaussian, that the forecast itself has a Gaussian distribution. And then if you have two Gaussians, then the optimal combination of two Gaussians is also Gaussian, which means the exact update is perfectly known. But in practical applications, we know that our forecast PDF is often not Gaussian. So we can apply the ensemble common filter, but then it's an approximate solution. And it's an exact solution, but it's an approximate. Um, um, so the, the actual solution is exact according to the common filter, but it, it's approximate with respect to reality. Now, a lot of work we've also done on Bayesian inference. What's Bayesian inference? And again, after this, I'll show some uh, applications. Now, imagine that we have a hypothesis, which is our numerical model, say. And we like to what's calculate the, what's called the posterior distribution. What is the posterior density of our hypothesis given the observed data? So we have what's called a prior density, which means this is the density before we observe the new data Y tilde. Okay. That is the density probability of the model being correct before we collected the new data. So just the, the probability assigned to a model. Now, if we collect the new data and we want to incorporate that new data, then we need to apply this rule, which is called Bayes' law after Thomas Bayes. Um, this is our posterior distribution. This is what we're interested in. Then this is our prior distribution. This is what's called our conditional probability. It's similar to likelihood. And this is a normalization constant, also called evidence. Now, the evidence makes sure that this posterior distribution integrates to one because it needs to be a formal distribution. And there are two requirements of a formal probability distribution. First requirement is that the probability density is non-negative. And the second requirement is that the distribution integrates to one. If you integrate a Gaussian distribution, you will get a value of one. That's why you see that strange one over the square root in front of your exponent, because that takes care of the normalization so that you always integrate to one. Now, so here's an example. If this is my posterior and I just have a one dimensional problem, really easy, then this would be my maximum posterior density. And this area underneath, that is what's called the evidence. That's the integral. Um, now, we developed method to estimate that evidence. Now, we also worked on model averaging. This is a famous paper published in Science. Um, on how we can improve climate forecasts if you use multiple different models. And we worked a bit on model averaging well. So this was a table in the original paper. And what you see here, then these are the different weather climate models. These are the different application areas. And if you compute the ensemble mean, where each member just is weighted equally, you see that the forecast already improves a little bit. Now, if you actually don't weigh the models equally, but determine the weights from linear regression, which is 
an analytic solution. So you don't need to do anything difficult. It's just an analytic solution for the weights. Then what you see, it improves even further. In other words, this demonstrates if you're interested in predicting that there is an advantage to using more than one model. Now, I'm never, I've never been that interested in prediction. Um, I'm more interested in, uh, again, model structural errors. Um, so the question is, why is this? Now, you can say, yeah, um, each model will have some errors. And probably if we use multiple models, different processes, or they differ in, they should differ in process uh, implementation, maybe discretization, other assumptions, then they cancel out some of these errors and, and you know, the mean is better than, uh, than the most individual, uh, most of the individual models. That's the underlying idea. Um, and that usually works, my experience is, with uncalibrated models. At least that's our research has shown. If you have calibrated models that are very well calibrated, then the averaging doesn't really improve on the best forecast. So how does that work again? We have three models. This is our observation. Now you can do point averaging and that point averaging just gives you a weighted prediction that was done in that paper. But what you can also do is something that I think is a step better is density averaging. And that is each model has its own uncertainty and so you're interested in the weighted density so that's a weighted combination of the forecast pdfs of the individual models and that also gives you a point prediction so we've done methodological development on model averaging now something i worked on uh, more recently is something called approximate bayesian computation so how does that work now Here's an example. Imagine we have some experimental data and each observation obviously has an epsilon, an, an error say. We sample our model, we assign a prior, we sample our uh, prior, then evaluate our model, creates different simulations. And now we look each simulation, whether it satisfies the epsilon values we described. If it does, then the model is considered behavioral. If it doesn't, it's considered non-behavioral. And this approach is actually really interesting. And it's, it's called approximate Bayesian computation. Um, you can show that this approach gives you the exact posterior distribution. In this case, I have here the posterior of two parameters, and there are more, but these here. You just look at all the accepted simulations. You know what parameters went in there. And so if you make histograms of each parameter of the accepted samples, this is the posterior. And this posterior is the same as your normal Bayesian posterior. Um, if the epsilon value is defined in a certain way, it just should be very small. Now, this approach caught my attention a number of years ago because practical application to earth systems will mean that all models are rejected because there's no model that can always describe the data within a really small yeah, band around that data point. It's, in, it's nearly impossible. So an extension of this is that you don't use the data, but you use summary metrics of the data. I'm not saying you should do this, but uh, you should use summary, but for instance, you can compute the mean of the data. That's your summary metric. It's much easier for your model to satisfy the mean and to satisfy each individual observation. So if you work with summary metrics instead and you apply this approach, that is something we used and, and that gives you a lot of interesting results in terms of model structural errors. This is the way forward, but I'm not presenting on that today. Um, but this is approximate basic computation. You may have heard of it. This is a field that's uh, yeah, booming. This has really come up in the last 10 years. Also likelihood free approaches. Okay, now, so we develop methods to do this efficiently, to sample efficiently, etc. Now, an extension of this is what is um, being pushed by some, and that's called limits of acceptability. This is an informal approach, informal Bayesian. So you have data, and around each data point, you just define limits of acceptability, and those include all your uncertainty, like based on your field knowledge, everything included, you just say, you know what, I consider this acceptable for the simulation. 
Now, once you have those limits, you need to sample the parameter space or the model space to see or to get all the realizations that will fall within those limits. And this is what you get then, the gray band. That's the behavioral space. Now, if you have the behavioral space, you can, you can look at whatever you're interested in in the, in the distributions of the parameters. Now, model selection. We talked about briefly, or I talked about the evidence, the denominator in Bayes' law. Now, it's a complicated problem. How can you estimate that area under your posterior, in your posterior? That requires numerical integration. And in high dimensions, that, that is cumbersome. How can you have a generic recipe that can integrate a high dimensional distribution, which may be multimodal uh, with disconnected modes? Um, so here is a simple example. Let's say that these dots, this is two parameters here, and you see the dots, and those are what's called the posterior samples. Okay, you see they're correlated, theta one and theta two. This is the mean. And you see here the more or less the distribution, which is bivariate normal. So how can you now infer the area, the volume under that distribution? Now, so we developed a method that can give us that volume. And why is that useful? Now that's for model selection. So here you see what's called a base factor. This is your area, essentially your evidence, the denominator in base law of model one, and this is the area under its posterior of model two. And these two models can have different complexities, different number of parameters. Now, if you compute the ratio, that's called the base factor. And if you have the base factor, you can determine which model is most supported by the data. So this is model selection. We talked about model averaging as antithesis. Now we talk about model um, selection. So in this case, if you have a set of models that have a very different complexity, you can still select the model that is statistically honored or most preferred by the data. Usually what we do, we resort to a base information criterion or an Akaiki information criterion to do so, but those make different assumptions about the model. This is assumption free. So this is the way to do it. So we developed a method that can get us the integral um, and, and integrate numerically a high dimensional posterior distribution. When I talk about high dimensional, I talk about at least 100 parameters. So here you see, if you have your base criterion, what that means in terms of rejecting a model or uh, whether one model is favored over another, according to uh, Jeffries, it's a classic paper. Now, here's some applications quickly. Um, let's see what time it is now. So, um, can data assimilation enhance the skill of a population model? So, here we have a two predator, two prey model. We have data here of the two preys and the two predators. Um, I'm not emphasizing the data here. I just wanted to emphasize the model. You see here, two differential equations. Uh, four differential equations, two predators, two preys, they're coupled, creates these oscillations that we know about the coupled predator prey, which can be chaotic. Um, and so we have this unique data set and we use this model now with data assimilation and another methodology we developed to see if we can forecast this system. So here the next slide is where you see the predators and the preys. And you see here forecast proficiency we defined here as uh, something we called acceptable. And here the forecast horizon. And you see that generally if, we if the acceptable model error increases, then the forecast horizon increases because you know, you're less st strict essentially. So now what's the point here is this intelligent soda approach is the method we use is data assimilation this is wavelet analysis, and this is the null model. And the null model here, you see this line, is the forecast horizon we get if the predicted abundance at the next time is simply the predicted abundance at the current time. So it's a really simple model. My prediction for tomorrow is my measured value today. And you see that that approach gives us the best forecast horizon, essentially, that models 
cannot get to that simple model. Yeah, you, you do need the data, but you also need that with data assimilation, you always need the current data to forecast for tomorrow, right? So that question, that shows how complicated uh, uh, these systems are essentially. Now, land transactions application we did is the relationship between willingness to pay and distance. So this is a data set of land transactions in the Netherlands, distance from the home of the farmer and the transaction price for the land. This is per square uh, acre or so, per acre. So we collected 6,000 of these transactions. And now the question is, does the willingness to pay of a farmer how does that depend on the distance to its home? In other words, if you're a farmer and you want to buy a piece of land, would you pay more for the land that's close to your home than if that land is like 10 kilometers away? Now, we set up a model to do this, which is a numerical model, but it's a Monte Carlo. So it's new, uh, we, we run essentially a virtual land market, and then we estimate the parameters of the land market from the data. So this is what you see. This is the actual data. And this is now the simulated data, which is actually quite good. And with our virtual land model, we can actually look at that relationship between distance and willingness to pay. And here you see that relationship with the posterior 95 prediction uncertainty. Now, I'll, uh, this is a geophysics application. Imagine you have a concrete structure and there's a void, there's water in there. Can we detect that location, that void? Because it's a structural weakness. So here we use crown penetrating radar and we analyze that crown penetrating radar and we can actually, we show that we can actually infer exactly the locations of those structural weaknesses. Um, now, other work I did recently is on uh, um, depth to bedrock geomorphology. We have a watershed we have a number of locations here. You see here the white dots where we have measured the depth to bedrock, student of mine. And we developed then a model, um, landscape evolution model. And we actually predict, we, we calibrate that model and then we predict the depth to bedrock and then we evaluate um, that model. So um, there's a lot of model development in here, theoretical development and then uh, application, uh, Bayesian analysis. Um, now, cloud aerosol interaction is more later. Um, other application, remote sensing, soil moisture retrieval. The algorithms we developed give us the Bayesian posterior, right? Now, you can apply all that, those, those computer algorithms, the, those codes, to any type of problem. This is soil moisture retrieval from satellite data. There's, there are models involved there. There are parameters that you need to estimate, brightness, temperature, you calibrate or you estimate parameters from brightness, temperature. And there's been assumptions that people use about the uncertainty and, uh, you know, the Bayesian uncertainty, uh, that's the correct, not the linearized uncertainty. And here we compare that for different approaches. Now, you can use Bayesian inference for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, determining the value of data. Here, in this case, we show two different data types measuring soil moisture content. Each a bar is an uh, is or uh, two bars next to each other, different color, but it's one and the same parameter in the model. And we compare here their posterior mean and their posterior uncertainty. Because the conclusion has always been that ERT and TDR data give us different information, and this shows that more or less you cannot um, say that statistically because both methods more or less give the same parameter values. Now, eco hydrology is an optimality. A concept, uh, optimality of, of the carbon profit. Uh, so without any parameters or without any uh, uh, calibration, you can actually estimate the parameters by just maximizing the net carbon profit of the model. Now, after we do that, we can then evaluate the model against data and it's actually not bad. So here we just didn't use any data to calibrate the model. We just calibrate the model by saying, whatever you do over a long term, you need to maximize your carbon profit, carbon uptake. Now, hydropower, runoff river with different uh, reservoirs. Here we develop a hydropower or a runoff river hydropower model, and that includes design variables, management variables, uh, etc. And then we can calibrate those um, 
so that we have according to multiple criteria. Now here's a groundwater example where we use emulation because it's a high dimensional problem. We built an emulator, then on top of that, we do dimensionality reduction, and that gives us then really nice high dimensional permeability fields that otherwise would be impossible to do because these models are numerically really intensive. Now, two more slides. Uh, more recent work is on sensitivity analysis. I have uh, students taking my class and some of them kept asking, Professor, why don't you really teach a lot about sensitivity analysis? And I said, yeah, I'm not really interested in that topic. I was realizing that a lot of people are publishing on that. And so I thought I walked out a number of years ago in my class and I was like, you know what, let's, let's, let's work on that. And so I created a bunch of slides for the next lecture. But um, so ideally what we like is what people work on is you have a model and you want to determine how sensitive that model is to each of its input, which is now the largest of those inputs, which now most contributes to the uncertainty in the, or yeah, uncertainty in the output. So in this case, you see your pie chart for each of these sources. You see here how they contribute to the output uncertainty of the models. So in this case, you see, we should focus on the forcing data, it's uncertainty. Now, normal approach people do this is, most of you probably know, is we have a model, we change an input a little bit, and we compute using a two-sided interval or a one-sided interval, the sensitivity. And then you can combine those two if you want that you get a two-sided interval. This is the way we compute sensitivities. This is a Jacobian approach. Now, this is very uh, sim simplistic. It doesn't really work well in high dimensions because you, you give you localized estimates, not over your entire space of input factors. So last slide is, recent work we're doing is on correlated sensitivity analysis, which is an ANCOVA decomposition analysis of covariance. And I just want to go to the last um, equation. This highlighted in red, this is what we're working on now. We developed a whole framework with extensions on how you can do sensitivity analysis, variance-based using correlated input factors. So I thought originally I was going to be around 45, now it's 53. So um, thank you so much. And if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jasper. Uh, any, any questions? Uh, Jerry Lynn had one in the chat. Jerry, did you want to uh, uh, bring, that, bring that up? I have a question and comment there. Oh yeah, just a minor comment. Um, uh, so uh, there was this paper that came out uh, not too long ago, uh, talked about how uh, in very high dimensional space, you're significantly more likely to set up saddle points than uh, local minima. And uh, given a high, sufficiently high dimensional space, the chances of being stuck in the local minimum are fashionably small. But um, that was a minor aside. Yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would disagree with that. But it depends on, uh, because, um, if you really go in the optimization literature, um, the problems that I, uh, so when we, there are two, two sides to this story. The problems that we test our algorithms on are um, problems that we've defined and they're very complicated. They have millions of local minima. Some algorithms, they have, none of the algorithms works on all the problems. So if I show you those response surfaces, they're in part, it's like a needle in a haystack, the most complicated problems. Um, once they work for those, we know they will work for practical application. Practical application is much easier because once you have a model that is based on a differential equation or, or, a, or a system of differential equations, they really make the surface deterministic. So you're not going to have a lot of really strange, peculiar properties in your response surface that you're going to have when you face those problems we define ourselves. So I would believe, I can read the paper, the outcome of that paper is it if it's a practical application where you have a relatively deterministic response surface. But I can easily show you response surfaces where that's the, I, I, that can absolutely not be true. So that's probably for, very when interesting. It's not paper. Sure, how, how many dimensions uh, do you have? Oh, for the, um, so we're talking about the optimization work we did a number of years ago. So we were going up to 100 at that point. 
Um, I can show you some uh, response services there. Um, so in fact, on some of these uh, problems, none of the outcome works. None of them can find the optimum. It's a, uh, honestly, some of them are finding a needle in haystack. So imagine you have a surface that's always horizontal and there's one location where you suddenly have a minimum. So it's, again, it's an artificial problem. There's no algorithm in the world that's ever found that, that, that solution. And why? Because it's always flat. So most algorithms conclude there's nothing there. To find the minimum, you need to have a direction of improvement. Otherwise, an algorithm is lost, right? If it doesn't know where to walk. So we have some of these problems that are so complex that just to test how, how, how strong is the algorithm. So what I read from your statement, I can have to read the paper, but um, I would think this is an application with a deterministic surface. There, there are conditions on that surface. But in general, maybe what the paper is saying as well is that in higher dimensions, that even though you still don't find the solution, you're less sensitive, you're more likely to find the solution. You're less sensitive to the uh, local minima. Hello, Jasper. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, this is Bao Xian from Lawrence Limo Lab. I just graduated from hey. the theorem two years ago. Yes. And my question is, I learned from you a lot about the uncertainty analysis, but uh, it seems that what you have been doing is a bottom-up approach, trying to analyze the uncertainty coming from different uh, components, like input, boundary, and model structure parameters. What do you think of the methodology of a top-down approach, like variational inference for analyzing the uncertainty sources, which can scale up to big data? Yeah, so that is, uh, I'm very happy you bring it up. A good question, very good question. So in recent years, um, my, my, because in the last three, five years, I've really done a lot of thinking which direction do I want to come with, with my research because I've done so many applications in the in the past 10 years and uh, that's all nice but at the time of writing it's easy to create research ideas right and then to to uh, like to do research and to get all kind of interesting results but then at the time of writing to write really impactful papers in 30 different fields where you, where you talk about so many different languages. It, took me, it takes me so much time to read the literature each time to get, uh, you know, you work with students and, and they have all kind of interests, but you know, obviously as, a, as an advisor or person involved to get the papers to a level where you think, hey, they're really good, they read well, takes a lot of effort. So I decided to slow down uh, the, the diversity to focus on a few key areas. And one of which is, um, there are, there are two methods that can couple different data sets. So there's no underlying model, essentially, model-free um, approaches that can couple different data sets that are seemingly not related, but that we can learn new things from that. So there's some data out there. But yes, yeah, so the work, usually what I've done involves models that we already have or that we developed based on process uh, process that we know. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, epistemic uncertainty, but um, usually relatively well contained. Next step is now to go to larger scale and different domains, combining those. And the point is that a lot of these methodologies are applicable, but computationally too demanding. So that's why efficiency is a key consideration. So the next step is how can we implement these methods, methods in such a way that they can really work with big data, things you're talking about, I guess, right? Oh uh, yeah, but MCMC cannot scale up to massive data for now. Do you have um, any thoughts about the further improvement? Like, do we need to approximate MCMC or approximate? PDF estimation, just abandoning MCMC. Yes. So we recently published a paper, but that's just heading in that direction where we combine the common filter idea um, with MCMC, um, which already shows uh, improvements uh, in, you know, factor three to five, but you're talking about, uh, you know, we need at least a hundred times faster. 
uh, in high dimensions. And if we have uh, thousands and thousands of parameters, then I think the net, because we're facing the same problem with sensitivity analysis here. We're developing a, a, fr a framework that works, but it can only handle up to 100, 150 parameters because then the, the, the matrices, the information you need to store is just blowing up. So, um, so a lot of issue is there with high dimension. So we make a lot of progress, but to make the next step, there's still that that may require a very different formulation, but also with quantum computing coming out, that may all also change like completely because quantum computers, they can do things that the computers now cannot do. The way they solve problems is fundamentally different. So that may open up the approaches, uh, may open up new ideas, but also implementation that's currently impossible. Like MCMC talk about sequentially, um, that's sequential, it's a sequential legacy. We come up with methods that we can parallelize it, but even then you, it doesn't, it works, but not if you're involving a lot of data with a lot of unknowns, just still inefficient. You can make improvements better, better 10 times, but you may need a whole new form for, uh, formulation. I think the quantum computing is really gonna help with that. That's gonna make the next step. Plus it will allow us to do much faster calculations, so. Okay, well, thanks so much, Jasper. It's uh, two o'clock, so we're gonna end the formal seminar time now, uh, but we'll, we'll go ahead and have this room open uh, longer. If uh, you know, this is a time we'd go have snacks. So I invite you to have some virtual snacks now. <laughs> I want to chat with Jasper a few minutes here. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be around a bit longer, but thanks again, Jasper. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yes.